Welcome to Corwin's Teacher to Teacher podcast with host Carol Pelletier Radford. Carol is an experienced classroom teacher, university educator, founder of mentoringinaction.com, and author of four best selling professional books for teachers. She believes the best form of professional learning happens when teachers engage in authentic conversations and share their wisdom. In every episode, Carol and her guests share stories about pivotal moments in their careers, successful classroom strategies, and personal actions they take to minimize stress and stay healthy. The Teacher to Teacher podcast is a place to engage in authentic conversation and reflection with experienced educators. We hope these conversations will energize you, keep you inspired, and remind you why you chose to become a teacher. Hello, welcome to the Teacher to Teacher podcast, sharing our wisdom with our host, Carol Radford. I am Tori Bachman, a Corwin editor and co-organizer of this podcast, which we've created for teachers at all levels who are searching for practical wisdom they can use in their classrooms. We believe we're all constantly learning and we're learning together. To share their wisdom today, we have two teacher guests with broad experience and interesting backgrounds. We have Maggie McHugh and Erin Jacobson and I'll introduce them to you now. Maggie Lee McHugh is a mathematics education professor at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. Her book, Bringing Project-Based Learning to Life in the Mathematics Classroom, published with Corwin Press, highlights her dedicated advocacy for classrooms to become vibrant learning places where mathematics can be experienced authentically. That sounds beautiful. Hi, Maggie. So great to have you here today. Hi, thank you, Tori. And Erin Jacobson is a dedicated advocate for beginning teachers, leveraging her experience as the coordinator of the North Dakota Teacher Support System for the past seven years, with a background spanning roles as an elementary classroom teacher and instructional coach. Erin is committed to fostering supportive structures that empower educators to thrive. Erin is also one of the educators who's featured in Carol's recent book titled when I started teaching, I wish I had known weekly wisdom for beginning teachers. Hi, Erin. Hi, Tori. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We're so happy that you both can make the time to be with us today. We've been looking forward to this conversation and we really appreciate the time to learn with you and to learn from you. Um, I will now turn this over to Carol. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Tori. I always get excited when we are, uh, matchmaking these two teachers who don't know each other and bringing them together from different parts of the country. So it's so exciting. What I what I really love about the Teacher to Teacher podcast, this is season two, and what, what happened in season one is the magic in these conversations when we bring teachers together that don't know each other but have that same commitment to supporting our students and supporting be beginning teachers. So I'm really excited about about this conversation. So let's just dive in. So Erin, I'm going to start with you and Maggie next. Tell me what you're doing, what that means that you're supporting beginning teachers for seven years in the huge state of North Dakota. And how did you get there? Like, yeah. were you a classroom teacher? What, what made you decide to do this? Sure, I'd be happy to. So yes, I am the coordinator of what we call the North Dakota Teacher Support System. And North Dakota is a very large state, but it's not very well populated. And so we, as a state, can offer a first year and a second year mentoring program for all teachers in our state. How did I get here? Well, I originally, um, I was a social worker, um, but I went back to school and I became a teacher. I taught, um, my first teaching gig, I taught second grade in the morning and I taught fifth grade in the afternoon. I taught second grade with my second grade teacher and she wasn't happy about it. She didn't want anybody to know about that. And I really, uh, I felt like at that point, I knew that I needed, that I really had a passion for figuring out how to support beginning teachers. Because even though I came in a little bit of a different way, I needed support and I wasn't quite finding it. So you were a career changer who had, were you unhappy as a social worker or was the, the passion for teaching never occurred to you? Like you just, how did that intersection happen? Were you helping? Both my parents were social workers. So one worked in oh. human services and one was a therapist. Okay. So it just seemed like the natural way. Um, 
However, when I was working in social work, I found that really who I wanted to work with was students, children. And so um, as I worked in a few different ways as a social worker, I realized what my heart was in was teaching. Yes. You were listening to yourself and then you got the job. And I'm going to kind of segue into my next question because I'm curious now about a pivotal moment. So you had a pivotal pivotal moment when you changed careers. And I don't know what your parents said about that, but <laughs> you changed careers and then you end up teaching second grade, fifth grade. You're with this mentor who doesn't want to maybe, or maybe isn't prepared to be a mentor, had no training and you're learning from that person. So what happened then? What another pivotal moment Sounds great. Right. Like. Yes. You know, I, I felt like I got good grades in college that I, I wanted to be there. I had this passion, um, but I felt a little lost. And the other part of it is the school that I was teaching at was very small. So um, just one classroom per grade and to collaborate or figure out um, what what others were doing was difficult. And so I all along thought this isn't quite right. Um, people that come into this field have worked really hard and they don't seem to be getting support in that first year or second year. Or who do you go to? So I started going to um, the speech language person in our building and asking her. She, she was the one that smiled the most at the um, staff meeting. So I thought she must be most approachable. I love that. <laughs> so there's the physical, how it matters the, what we, what we display on our face. So that's how you chose her to be your informal mentor. Right. How yeah. did you get from the classroom then to the coordinator for the state? Um, so after I, I taught for a few years and I, I finally got to kind of graduate from second and fifth grade, and I had my own classroom as a third grade teacher. Um, I I decided I was ready to keep learning. I, I love school. I love to learn. Uh, I think a lot of teachers do. It's not always come very easily to me, but I, I love the process. And so I decided I'd throw my name in the hat for a new position during the summer. They had opened up some different positions, and I thought, well, why not? I got an interview for it and I became an instructional coach. Um, that was another weird, weird time because instructional coaching at that time was very, very new. And so I taught, I coached K through second grade teachers in reading only and for five different schools. Did that for a number of years. Um, by the time I moved into this position, I was coaching just at one school, all curriculum case five. Um, so it was, it was just exciting to keep learning and growing. And I think that that's really, um, cool about our profession that we, yes, we can yes. do different things. So it sounds like that seed was planted early on when you were a beginning teacher. That's your moment to help other beginning teachers. So thank you for sharing that. And we're so, your state's so lucky to have you because you were a beginning teacher. So so recently, and then you all have your social worker skills too. So Maggie, you are in a very different place, but also influencing university. So beyond the classroom, share what you're doing now with your math education, but how did you get here? And did you always want to be a teacher? And let's just see how that lines up with Erin's journey. Yeah. Um, so you asked if I always want to be a teacher and I think uh, the answer is definitely yes. I come from a strong line of educators in my family. I'm actually really proud to be a fourth generation teacher. Uh, both parents were educators, grandma on my dad's side. And we have, um, as family history, some ledgers of my great grandmother who taught um, reading and writing and simple arithmetic out of her home. Um, and they bartered uh, in her in the rural Wisconsin here and they bartered for eggs and chicken and different things for the lessons. So um, very proud to be fourth generation teacher. Uh, so teaching has been in my blood, is in my passion. I graduated uh, with degrees in English and mathematics. And my first teaching job was high school English, like creative writing, journalism, American literature, contemporary literature. 
Um, and while I was teaching high school English, I decided to go back and get a master's degree. Um, and, you know, I think Aaron had said lifelong learning. That's absolutely where my journey is too. Um, and then I decided to start my doctorate um, with the with the intent someday to teach at the university level. I saw myself really called at some point to be there. Um, and while I was working on my doctorate, I was studying social justice education. Um, and the school I was at um, had a pretty tight curriculum. And so I was looking for a place that would allow me uh, the opportunity to explore um, and pursue different passions and maybe um, go outside of curricular boundaries. And I was very fortunate to be hired into a project-based learning middle school. Uh, but what I was hired on to do was to work on the mathematics side of the house. So I switched into using that degree more in a project-based learning setting. Um, and I had 10 amazing years working with middle school students. The project-based learning was not just the mathematics. I got to use so much creativity, bringing STEM ideas together, humanities ideas together, art, um, really wove all of that together. Um, and recently, just this past year, the position opened at the university I wanted to be at in math education. And um you know, applied and, and received that position. And so now I'm working with pre-service teachers, influencing that next generation of teachers in their mathematics education journey. I love that. And so interesting though, the English and the math, there aren't many of us that can hold both sides of the brain yeah. in a balance. So you are so unique and gifted and wise. We, we can benefit from, uh, how you look at the world and that you could work with middle school kids, right? <laughs> we, yeah. we know, Erin, that, that's not always easy. <laughs> uh, so so thank you for sharing that pivotal moment. So we heard Erin's pivotal moment really came from within herself as a beginning teacher thinking, I need to help these people because I'm not getting the help I need. Uh, what, did you have something like that or what? Yeah, I, I did, Carol. Actually, um, I told you I, I moved into this project-based learning school, um, and I really didn't know much about project. Uh, let's not say I didn't know much. I really didn't know anything about project-based okay. learning. Yeah, what is it? Could you tell it, our listeners we're all going, there's so many different definitions. There's but... so many definitions. My definition centers on um, students using a, a driving question, like a big question that they need to answer, and throughout the entirety of the unit, they're investigating this question. They are developing public products towards that question. Um, they're learning rigorous content level. And at the same time, um, they're engaging in learning success skills or life skills, such as cooperation, communication, um, perseverance, self-management, um, all in service of answering this question. So what's an example of a question? Sure. Um, here's one. I'll bring it down to Erin. I worked with a second grade classroom. Um, okay. So for my book, I did a lot of research in different classrooms. And a second grade classroom said, how can we attract bees to our community garden? Ah. So okay. they wanted to learn because they learned about pollinators and they knew bees were pollinators. I know so there is a bee crisis yeah. Uh, in terms of our population. And so we studied the science behind the bees. We looked at the different plants. We did some lab experiments. The students designed bee hotels. They're actually called Love bee it. hotels, not little <laughs> bee houses. Um, and we had um, a, a carpenter come in and look at their designs and took parts of each of their designs to build a bee hotel, which we installed in their community garden. So they get to see, so who, who helps them come up with the questions? And Erin, do you know anything about any of this that we're talking about? I, do. Well, I got to do some PBL training when I was um, in the classroom and I love the, I love the whole idea and the whole, con and it really does work in the classroom. It just helps tie everything together and give much more meaning than any worksheet or, you know, um, it's, it's really exciting work. Because yeah. the students are actively mm -hmm. working towards, like, how does it relate to, like, service learning or project, other 
office? Yeah. Are all the questions based <laughs> in outside of the classroom engagement or? I think, I think Carol, it can go so many different ways. Um, you could have a very service oriented project, you know, building the bee hotel for the community garden was very service oriented. Right. Um, sometimes though, the project is, um, possibly creating, um, it could be like social media flyers or a website students are putting okay. together. Um, I had some students, um, investigating how best to design an accessible park or playground. Um, and so they were working as architects and engineers, um, creating blueprints, um, and they did present some of their blueprints to the community, uh, but they're not necessarily like actually building and implementing that park. I love the way you're talking about this. Recently, I was um, talking with Dennis Shirley and Andy Hargreaves about their new book, Identity. Um, and what is showing up with this identity issue is that students are looking for an identity that's beyond what we're putting on them, you know, be a student, you know. So this project-based system, which I'm actually going to go into my next question for you about, tell me more about your book and a few of the specifics of what steps a teacher could take. Um, relates to this identity that we put on our students or don't put on them, that they can be contributors beyond that label that we're giving them, that they're just taking everything in, that they're creators. Am I expressing Absolutely. it correctly? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we all are seeking our identity. You know, Aaron and I both identify as educators. Um, that I know, Erin, you were sharing earlier before we started this about identifying as a mom sometimes, right? And we all have those yes. identities, identifying as a friend, um, as researchers, as authors, right? We, we hold so many different identities. And in the classroom, it's exciting for students to take on those identities beyond just being second grader or middle schooler, yes. right? They're um, community activists, Right. I love that. It yes, so broader. Designed. It's more right. engaging. It it yes. it gives us an example of what people can do. So let, I'm going to go with my next question for you because I think it segues nicely. So you're you're right. Tell us the title of your book. Uh, why you decide? Is this your first book with Corwin? It is. Okay. So yay. Um, so let's let's hear it. Okay. Tell me about this topic and why I should be enthusiastic if I'm a listener to this podcast and buy your book and integrate some of this into my own classroom or statewide, Erin. Yeah. <laughs> <There you laughs> <go>. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So go for it. The book is called Bringing Project-Based Learning to Life in Mathematics. And I think we are already talking about like, how is it so engaging? Like we want it to come to life. We want our classrooms to become vibrant, energetic places where our students um, do embody these roles um, and can see themselves as agents of change. Um, so the book has three parts. The first part is the why. Why project-based learning? And I highlight everything from, you know, students being agents of change, equity, um, opportunities to really have a more equitable teaching practice in classroom. Um, and then really just at the heart, a, a student-centered philosophy, how the stories that students have shared um, about their identity and agency. I then go into a little bit about the what, um, and specifically in the mathematics classroom, sometimes math teachers, um, it takes a little bit more of a leap for them to conceptualize a project. Um, often when I work with teachers who maybe are more in our humanity side of the house or some of our um, art side of the house or science where they're constantly asking these big questions and investigating questions, um, it seems more natural. But math has always been a little bit more of a puzzle. Um, and when you talk about my journey, when I entered that math PBL classroom, what the classroom at the time was doing was saying, well, here's all of our projects. Oh, and then we have this math curriculum that we work on. And, I oh, said, well, and that's the, de we'll the deadly, the the deadly yeah. Sorry. Right. Right. And I said, well, we just really uh. need to work on these skills. 
And I said, well, can we work on the skills in a map? It's like, well, sometimes we'll use a little math, but math yeah. was never the lead. Math yeah. was never the 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 lens that we used, um, or at least that at the time my school was using. So um, it sort of became the challenge of how best I could create projects, um, experiences, as I often left them up in my book, um, so that students could really engage authentically and see mathematics as a powerful tool um, and see themselves as mathematicians. Um, so could you buy the book? So if I was sure. reading the book, I'm listening, I'm a math yep. teacher. Yep. I will get sample questions because that's where I would fall down. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of getting your mojo now because you've got the English and the math. Uh -huh. So you know that you can create the questions that I'm going to need those. And then I don't have to replace my curriculum. I can just integrate one of these per semester or per quarter so that I don't, because I'm busy and I don't have a lot of time to Absolutely. add to my curriculum. So tell me how your book could benefit me. Is it going to be worth it to do this? <laughs> I, I fully believe so. Okay. Um, because you have the why part, the what part, and then the last part is the how. Okay, and I good. You the how. Also throughout the book, I lift up several projects. So there's a 4K or what people call pre-kindergarten or transitional kindergarten projects that I worked on, okay. um, a second grade project, fourth grade project, a couple middle school ones from my own experience um, in algebra one, geometry and algebra two projects. Wow. So you uh, get it covered. You I, have... I tried to give okay. <laughs> examples, opportunities, and in the additional resources, um, all of the ideas are written out in right. project format. For teachers, because you were a teacher. Yes. You taught. That's I, I, am I love about this. It's I am. I am a teacher. To teacher. We we can do this because yeah. we you did it. So Erin, yeah. you had some training in this. What what are you learning or taking away from this wisdom that Maggie's sharing with us in her first book? What are you hearing? Yeah. Well, I think you know it's hard for people in education. It seems like well, this new thing came, and now this new thing, and. What I loved about PBL as a as a teacher and as a parent watching my my girls do some of the projects at school is how invested they became. Um, that question, developing the question is so, so important because once you've got that question, it just keeps unfolding and you don't, you can't even imagine where it's gonna go. And you're adding in um, all of these different uh, standards and life skills as you go along and it's just exciting I mean one of my I remember my um first grade when Sophia my daughter was in first grade they did a project-based learning on with a with a restaurant in town and they were creating a new pizza and the <laughs> the I can't remember what the question was but the amount of standards that the teacher was able to fit in there and just so much excitement about this idea of creating this new type of pizza. And her little group won. And we all went to the restaurant and we got to eat it. It was called the Yay! Big Nacho. <laughs> That's <a> part. <laughs> but, you know, when she thinks back on school, she's going to think about those types of experiences. So it really brings so much learning to life. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so interesting that... You both have, have this connection to this project base. And I can already see, so here's a lot of novice teachers say they have trouble with classroom management. Mm -hmm. And here's how we minimize classroom management or behavior issues in the classroom is we engage the kids in something that they really want to do <laughs> and don't have the answer to. Yes. It's like the doctoral dissertation. I remember when I wrote my question. It is about the questions too, Maggie. Writing the question for the doctoral dissertation was the hardest thing that I ever did. And then I remember my advisor, my mentor saying, you better pick a question that you're interested in because you're going to stay with this question for a long time. And I kept getting stuck on writing a question that I already knew the answer to. Yeah. And there's guides and ideas in there of questions. There's guides right to create the question but it's so going to help the novices yes. manage even though it looks like controlled chaos 
because kids are going to be talking and interacting and creating new identities for themselves that are beyond their learning identities instead of all these other labels that I'm not even going to mention. So we just know what they are. So thank you for that. Now, Erin, I'm going to switch to you. And I'd like you to just share. Erin is featured in the book, which I love. When I started teaching, I wish I had known. And you wrote a story uh, called Honor Your Teaching Style. And you shared a moment that really touched your heart and that actually changed the way you moved forward in your teaching. So would you share like the nugget of that story with us? Sure, I'd be happy to. So yes, honor your teaching style. I was happy to be able to contribute that that story to your book. And it was really one comment that I received from the school counselor. She had an office um, really right next to my classroom. My classroom didn't even have any doors at the time. And so she was pretty much in my classroom, but she had her door open often and she, I had never thought of it, but she would listen in. And one day she said, I just love listening to you talk to your students. And I thought, oh, well, that's nice. And for me, that really made an impact because I was the youngest teacher at the school I was working at. Um, I didn't know if I was doing things right or wrong or otherwise, because I didn't have any teaching partners. I was the only, at that point, the only third grade teacher in my school. And so I wondered <laughs> quite a bit if I was on the right track or not. And her, those simple words really helped me to worry a lot less about sounding like, other teachers I was seeing or um, being maybe more stern or, you know, all of those things that kind of float around in your head as you're trying to figure out something. And it, it helped me to just be who I was and, and know that that was going to be okay, that I was treating the students with respect and I was happy to be there with them. And that's what mattered. What I love about your story and why I selected it is that we forget that novice teachers need that direct, clear feedback, not the broad generalities, you're doing a good job, that that a five-minute meeting, a, a one-minute compliment from someone who just generously gave that to you has influenced your path. And I, I'm pretty sure the way you're mentoring the beginning teachers in North Dakota is coming through you that we're recognizing who who does nourish us, who compliments us, what are we doing? But the other piece of that is beginning teachers trusting themselves. And the other part is everybody's watching us. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be you have to be thinking. Yeah. When we look around to school, we all are seeing everything. <laughs> and can so, I add that too, Carol? Yes. I would like to mention and lift up out of that story the fact okay. that the doors were open. Yes. I think as new teachers and as veteran teachers and as middle of the road, wherever we are at, opening our doors, welcoming others in, whether they're passing by and just yes. doorway here. Thank you. We need to make our thinking and our teaching styles and our you know, love and passion for teaching and learning visible. Um, and I, I think open doors are such a critical part. I love that. Thank you for, for adding to that. So, so we're going to wind down from this exciting conversation. I hope all of our listeners are taking away uh, the big, the nuggets here. And so my last two questions are, uh, one is, I really want to know how the two of you have sustained your positivity, your passion. Everybody wants the magic answer. It's not going to be a massage, a facial, and you certainly can do that. But self-care is kind of getting like a bad reputation that it's the way in which we can fix these very complicated issues. Um, but we do have to nourish ourselves and we do have to make decisions. So what do you do to keep yourself balanced, nourished? Um, 
what's your point of view, Maggie? What, how do you yeah. take care of yourself? Well, I'm going to link um, my tip to also in my book, I call project-based learning experiences. Okay. Something that nourishes me is experiences. Um, and so when I turned 30, I made a list of 30 things to do when I'm 30. I actually got the idea from another teacher friend. Teachers are always the most creative, right? So I made these 30 different experiences and it was a lot to do 30 in a year. So since then, I started making eight goals and I do two goals per quarter, four quarters for the school year. And those eight things to look forward to, those experiences, those nuggets, um, sometimes are big like travel, um, sometimes are small like writing a letter to a childhood friend. Uh, but the experience I'm most looking forward to in, in this upcoming year's list um, is to do um, something that I've always wanted to do for my favorite childhood TV show, I Love Lucy. Um, and I want to uh, be in a huge vat of grapes and do some grape stomp. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. I can see you doing out. that. We I, need a, a picture of that to go with this podcast. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I, I, I do something. So I'll, I'll share what I do sometimes when I need a balance or nourishment or um, something to do. I do something called dialogue journaling. And mm -hmm. I learned this a long time ago, I think from a social worker, Erin. It was a like an arts class. And this woman was teaching a group of us how to listen to our inner voices through writing. Mm -hmm. And that we could write in our journals, but not like a diary we would write and ask ourselves questions. So if I had this idea that I was gonna do eight things, I, it's making me very nervous though, cause I don't wanna say how old I am and that I'd have to do X number of things <laughs> in a year. I don't think I could fit it in anyway. Um, <laughs> the dialogue journaling is talking to ourselves. So I would just take a piece of paper and I might say, so which, eight things would I like to do? You're probably doing that process, Maggie. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know if you're writing it down or how you're I, doing I am. And I also, um, this year I am turning 40. And so I'm adding 40 things. Oh my gosh. So then 50 the and 60. I don't yep. know. It yep. goes <laughs> oh It'll go. God. But the fun part is asking friends and family to join in and add to my okay. list now. All so. right. I'm um, hooked. I might do five though, and sure. I'm going to do it in my dialogue journal. Sure. <laughs> so Erin, what do you do to nourish yourself? Uh, keep yourself focused sure. on what's important. Yeah. So I think, you know, when I was thinking about that, I, what came to mind for me, I do, I do things. I do, you know, drink water and get good sleep and try to do those types of things. But I also, give myself permission to go home. So I have a 15 and a 12 year old daughters and I found that just being available and being calm, not being scheduled and being home is really what they need most. And it and it helps bring me some peace too, that I'm, that I'm there, that, that we're a family and that I've given myself permission to transition from um, being a, a worker to being a mom and putting that hat on and that that means something to me personally as well so that's been so what that, currently yeah. is really sustaining me yeah and I think it's showing up so you choose and and these are choices that we're making experiences and you have you get an experience out of that mm -hmm. so as we dialogue what we want to do next um uh I I'm just grateful that you both shared kind of your inner inner heart of how you keep yourself so engaged in the work that's so important to us. Mm -hmm. So the final thing, and then we're going to, I'd like to have my, uh, have Tori summarize for us, but I would like you to give some, what's some like advice for all teachers, beginners, very experienced teachers are tired too. So what would the two of you say if you had a sentence of um, wisdom from from this podcast, Erin. What what's your wisdom? Sure, I I will say that the dark days don't win, 
um, they might come, they might stay too long, but the light keeps creeping in. And that's what, if we keep our focus on, where is it? Where is that light? Um, and doing the best we can and continue to show up. Those that light, those light days keep coming more and more. I love that. Thank you. And Maggie, what's your advice? Ah, mine is wisdom. Super, wisdom. Not right. Yeah. My my wisdom, I get think is super similar to Aaron. Um, it's uh, choose joy. Uh, wow. It's two words that I had um, a fabulous person on Etsy make me on a little bracelet, and so. Um, whether it's a dark day or just a regular day or a sunshiny day, um, I try as much as I can to put that little bangle on, look at those words to choose joy and um, realize that joy can be a choice um, and that my goal is to find it and um, choose to, to live and embrace it. Well, it has been a joy to to have this conversation with both of you. And Tori, I'd like you to jump in. So, so what are the highlights? What did you hear in this conversation oh, that our first, listeners need to hear. I actually am so, I'm smiling um, about the mention of joy and letting the light in because I actually um, read a poem this morning that talked about latent joy and it's been sort of on my mind all day. Like there's a line, um, is there joy where I can't imagine it? And I just think it's such an interesting connection that um, especially here we're recording in February, which is um, a time when you know, days are getting a little longer. It's still cold, but like the light is coming back. So I think that's a really nice message uh, for, for this day, but also for what we're talking about here. And I mean, in terms of threads, I, I think that there's always a little magic in these conversations, as Carol mentioned. Um, you both have such different backgrounds, but kind of found your way um, to where you are now in education and really listen to your um, to yourselves and listen to your heart. And Erin, I think your message about um, teaching style and, you know, that I wrote down the mention, you said, don't, you don't need to be like all the other teachers. I think that's a really important um, recognition that you made, but also something that can be really important for teachers at any level of their career. Um, and sort of, especially, you know, finding a, a pathway that, that makes sense for you as an educator. Um, Maggie, I love this conversation around project-based learning and frankly, I wish everybody was talking about it and implementing project based learning. And, um, I, you know, I think we are seeing more and more schools and especially teachers, you know, even if it's a teacher in their very own classroom, um, adopting some project based learning um, methods, I think it's really a transformative um, way to, to teach and to learn. Uh, I love the conversation around students uh, recognizing new identities for themselves, which also kind of ties into that finding your path in your career too, you know, kind of thinking about, um, you know, listening to your to your own interests and listening to your um, your own kind of intuition in terms of how you want to be as a learner and and how you want to contribute to your classroom. I think those are really important things for kids to to find out about early, you know. Uh, so thank you for that. I appreciate that conversation. Um, that's, those are the big things that Yay. I got out of this conversation. Thank, Thank you for sharing you. Your, those are your experience and your wisdom with us. Thank you, Tori, for your beautiful summary. I'd like to end this uh, podcast uh, session with a quote from Yogi Bhajan. And the quote is, travel light, live light, share the light, be the light. And I encourage all your all of our listeners to be the light to your students and yourselves. Thanks for listening to Teacher to Teacher. Until we meet again. Thanks everyone for joining today's Teacher to Teacher conversation. We hope this time together energized you, inspired you, and reminded you why you chose to become a teacher. You can purchase any of Carol's books and any books mentioned in the podcast online at www.corwin.com. Please leave a review and share this podcast with your colleagues. Thank you for listening to the Corwin Teacher to Teacher podcast, a place to share teacher wisdom and engage in authentic conversations with experienced educators. Come explore Corwin's free new teacher toolkit and resources. We've curated these resources based on extensive research from teachers, coaches, and principals alike. Whether you are brand new or a veteran teacher, find ready-to-go teaching tools at corwin.com today.